have a microphone. We have one question down in the corner. Start from there. Hi. Thank, um, thanks for the presentation. Fascinating stuff. Um, so I, I had a comment and a question, and, um, and I realize you only had 20 minutes. So, uh, In the case of uh, Mozambique, um, I think it, it might be important to think also about the counterfactual. I mean, so you're, you're describing a lot of the negative consequences, potentially, and gotten negative consequences. And I'm sure you're right, but we, all, we also want to think about what would be happening to those people in the absence of investment, you know, and what about the possibility for transfer programs if enough income is generated through this investment, which I, I don't know if it will be. And, and then in the case of Ethiopia, I'm a little confused, also fascinating, but um, it seemed like the, the investment by these guys is in the middle of nowhere in Ethiopia. <laughs> So, um, so worrying about effects on smallholders, I don't quite understand it. And what was the purpose of, what's the purpose of this investment in the first place? How are these guys planning to make money? Because transportation costs in Ethiopia are really high, and couldn't people in urban centers import rice more cheaply than, than what they'll get from this farm? So I'm, I'm just curious about that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Let me pick up a few questions down at the end. All right, thank you. My question goes to the Ethiopian uh, study. I, I'm just thinking this block farming issue, I'm just trying to see uh, the ownership of land. You, you mentioned about state ownership, uh, taking over and, and doing this block farming. Uh, is it, does the land belong to the state or how does it operate? The tenure security issues. I'm asking in relation to what I know in most part of Africa where land is owned by uh, families and so it's a challenge. As, in as much as we want to do block farming, we also are uh, sometimes preventing other families from cultivating their own parcels of land to, do, to use it for what they would have loved to do with it. So if you can throw us a bit of light on that, I'll be happy to know. Okay, thank you. So no, another one down there. Maybe you could identify there yourselves as well. Thank you. Uh, my name is Samuel from... Yeah, thank you. My name is Samuel from Ethiopia. Uh, the Ethiopian program is, is more or less dependent on the for, foreign dependent from technology to the markets. Almost the, the program does not has link any uh, link with the domestic economy in terms of market technology, and this puts sustainability or fragility questions on the program on the long term. Do you see any feasibility in terms of uh, promoting contract farming or outgrowers schemes which link uh, these companies with uh, the domestic? Okay, we've got another one up here. Martin. Thank you. Uh, my question is to, two questions to Ibrahim. But, um, the first is, is, is uh, there's a whole literature and uh, a lot of concerns about these regressions from the point of view of uh, endogenous placement of, of infrastructure at community level. Um, this is work going back to a paper by um, Mark Pitt and Mark Rosenzweig back early 90s and the literature following that. Um, and you, you don't mention this problem. It seems like for somebody in this, working in this literature, this is like the number one problem you have. And the problem is essentially that there are latent household characteristics which are correlated, geographically correlated in the sense that, that um, you know, people with poor characteristics in some unobserved way tend to live in places with poor infrastructure. And what you identify as an effect of infrastructure is not a causal effect of infrastructure at all. It could be entirely due to this latent characteristic that the infrastructure will be correlated with the error term. Um, so you've got to be aware of this problem, or at least uh, flag the, the concern. I, I, I think um, without panel data, and the Pitt and Rosenvik solution is panel data, uh, and then there's a subsequent literature on that, 
Um, I can give you references, but without a, a recognizing this problem, you're going to be vulnerable. Uh, the second point is I don't think you can make those conclusions at all uh, when you said that education has more imp impact on than infrastructure, because the, the comparison you're making is not cost neutral. You're not, you don't have, have a cost function. You, you, you can't say that just because of the regression coefficients on education are, are higher, if you like, than, than, than infrastructure or in some sense. Or, or it doesn't mean that investing in education is more cost effective than investing in infrastructure. You have to know the costs. Well, thank you. We better take a round of replies before we forgot everything. So maybe you could go first. Thank you, uh, and thank you, to Martin, for those two observations. Yes, the, uh, the first one on endogenous placement of infrastructure within community, I do admit that was an omission. And with regard to the cost, uh, I think I was rushing a little bit, but I did mention that uh, although we say we, uh, in the paper we claim to have rates of return, we don't have actual information about the cost. So, and it's the, uh, these rates of returns can be overturned if the actual costs are included. And in fact, the costs might differ in particular geographical regions or might be higher in particular regions than the other, even when we had the cost. So, I, in the paper, we do admit that this is a limitation, despite the fact that we come to that conclusion. Thank you. Well, thank you for your comment. Uh, I totally agree it's a biased uh, criticism in the sense that it's focused on the critical parts of the program. And sort of um, my, my, my idea is exactly to respond to the way that the formulation of the program has been made so far. And to try to, to emphasize the need to, from the beginning to build up a framework that, that takes into, a, into account the, the, the need to be inclusive which is totally missing from the program so far. Um, uh, and that includes, for instance, uh, what you mentioned about transfer policies. Uh, th th this is a must in a, in a program like this, and it, it needs to, to, to be uh, uh, the, the discussion on how will the fiscal part be affected. It, it needs to be in. So this is one of these of, 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 uh, of these elements. But yeah, you're right. The, all the, 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 the good sides, the possible good impacts, they are... Um, um, they are, they are absent. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thanks for the, for the questions. Um, Margaret, the, the motivation of the investor. So the, the Ethiopian government has basically two advises investors who are uh, capital intensive and not that area intensive to stay in the highland. So that's the floriculture and the vegetable sector mainly. Um, and all the more, for those crops who are more area extensive, um, they give out leases in the lowland, and it's part of a strategy to develop these areas. Um, but what the early evidence seems to show, and there's just a big Indian investor who seems to, to collapse um, and might get his land um, taken away again by the government, Karaturi, um, is the name of the investor, is that it's very, very difficult to get land operational in those remote corners. And even this investor, the Saudi star guy, um, had difficulties doing that. Um, the motivation of the investor, I mean, they showed me some initial uh, calculations, and they said, okay, we're going to reach seven to ten years after, after being operational break even. Um, I'm not sure if that is a realistic figure because they they had plans to already be operational now on about 4,000 hectares and they're only operating 300 because there was problems. So the, um, but yeah, I mean they they calculate the the market price and let's see. Um, ownership of land um, in Ethiopia it's a bit different in the different regions, but in general all land is owned by the government and local people have a use right and they can inherit the use right, and in some areas they can already transfer it freely, in others uh, only limited parts of the land. Um, in this area, as I s indicated, land per se is not scarce, so there's not 
until now no land market. Um, so it's a bit different from many other parts in Africa where you have high population density. This is a low population density setting where such investments might be a good way to promote growth, but you still should carefully look at the size at which you promote them. I think a lot of them are too big to be operational. Um, and Samuel, thanks for the good question on um, fragility and, and lacking link to the local economy. I totally agree. I think the, the investments are not paired with, with local strategies for the area uh, as well as they could. But, I mean, we talk about developing, developing countries with limited resources, so it's also difficult to do things on the ground. On the feasibility of contract farming in the, in the case of rice, um, in the Uganda case, they tried to do contract farming, and it worked for some years. But as soon as there is a side market um, where local farmers can sell the rice, which is the case nowadays in Uganda, the, the schemes collapsed because the um, they, yeah, farmers would sell it on the side where they got better prices. Or So it's a problem of enforcement and of contract costs. And also lack of trust, the relations between the investor and the local communities. If that is not good, um, the, the contract farming becomes very difficult to enforce, and a lot of investors don't consider that it might pay off to invest in good trust relation to the local communities initially. They come with the title and go there and say, we got it from your government, so we should get it. Okay. For the questions? Up front, yes. Thank you. Um, a couple of questions to uh, Isabella. Um, I'm Amrakwam from UNDP. Uh, working in Tanzania. We have a very similar uh, initiative in Tanzania called Southern Agricultural Growth Corridor, SAGOT. I don't know whether it's a kind of replication of what you have been doing there, uh, but it's very much similar. Uh, but one uh, problem we have there is that although it is a big initiative under the Agricultural First uh, initiative introduced by the president himself, uh, it didn't get off the ground as expected uh, because investors um, have some concerns about, especially on two uh, policy issues. One is the agricultural taxation and the other one is land issues. At a very recent uh, meeting, it was revealed that the, even the few investors that have been attracted are of low quality and these are the reasons that have been uh, attached to that. Uh, now, how now in this case of course the there's no clear policy signal from the government on these two particular issues how these two particular issues are addressed uh, in this particular case uh, in mozambique and brazil uh, the second issue relates to contract farming this is also one of the concerns we also have in tanzania uh, if the big f firms come and invest without having a greater impact on the poorer communities there it is not guaranteed, although the government says it is going to be, how uh, it is ensured in there, in that program, uh, whether it is uh, reflected in the MOUs between the private firms and the government, uh, how it is uh, done. The contract farming, contract, how it is enforced, whether, there is, uh, whether it is reflected uh, in the, say, MOUs or the contracts between the government and the firms to ensure that the, the outgrowers are reflected in the system. Hello, I'm Sylvia from University of Ghana. Uh, my, my question or comment actually um, it pertains to the one on contract farming. Um, the concern that I have is um, um, considering the fact that most of these farmers are illiterate, if they actually do understand the contracts that are signed. Because the case is for Ghana, where um, there's a scheme for oil palm plantation. Uh, farmers actually stopped, you know, participation because they felt cheated. They didn't understand the contract from the onset. And when deductions that were started, um, when deductions were made from what were due them, they couldn't understand it and then they, were, they felt cheated and then they were like, no, we are not being part of this any longer. So how do you think um, in, in, your, in your case, these contracts are being 
explain to farmers because it's a very long document which is kind of legally binding. Thank you. I'm uh, Carl Poe from IFPRI in Malawi. Um, also a question for Isabella, an easy one. Um, you know, from the Malawi side, we're certainly aware of the Nakala Corridor. I mean, you're building the railway straight through our backyard. Um, but I don't know if, if, if there are any concerted efforts for the two countries to kind of collaborate and maybe bring Malawian farmers on board as well to kind of become part of this value chain. Um, Malawi has a, a new strategy called the National Export Strategy, also a kind of value chain approach and contract farming in the works. Um, I mean, you'd think um, it would be obviously potentially mutually beneficial if, if uh, for both countries if they could collaborate. I don't know if you know of any, any such efforts. It's Baumgarten. Sorry, I'm Maggie from IFPRI and Tufts. Um, so what you said second in response to my question is more sort of consistent with what I know about Ethiopia. So now I'm going to ask you, why are you evaluating this project if it's not even, if it doesn't even seem like it's financially viable? Because I've heard a lot about investors who are speculating in land there, who have these huge land holdings, but maybe they're just holding on to them to see if the price goes up and so forth. So you understand my question, right? Thank you. Mwabo from Kenya. Uh, the last presentation. How did you compute the shunt of prices of labor and the land? Thank you. Oh, no. Does it work still? Yeah, it does. Sorry. So um, the first question relating to taxation and land issue, how it's being dealt by, by the Mozambican government. Well, land issue in Mozambique is quite special because the land is formally owned by, by the state and the peasants, they have the right to use it. They have a title that allows them to use it for a certain period. Um, there is a lot of debate over the land, uh, the land issues in Mozambique, but one... Um, um, one positive side, you can say, of this system is that everybody has a reasonable equal access to land, and the very bad side of this is that it's very easy to displace people. So what happens in the case of Mozambique is that if, uh, oh, well, it, 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 it's typical in the case of the mining explorations in, in that province, for instance, where it was uh, the process of displacement, it's, it's, really, um, it's really easy to be done because, well, the, 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 the process of changing people from place to place, it's quite fast there in Mozambique. Uh, regarding taxation, there is uh, uh, foreigners, once they get the, the right to use the land for a certain period, which is usually around 30 years, they have to pay a tax over land, which is extremely low in the case of, uh, in the case of Mozambique. And this is something that uh, national academics and civil societies are starting to pressure a lot to exactly to avoid the same type of, uh, of advantages that, uh, that have marked the, 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 the mega projects, the large scale uh, mega projects that are taking place. Most of them are, are taxed, they have a huge tax exemptions. So, um, uh, the second question about uh, uh, contract enforcement. Yeah, it's a huge problem uh, for the schemes that are already taking place in the country. Uh, both companies, firms and farmers, they complain about it, about the lack of enforcement. And uh, farmers, they feel that they are always being cheated. And uh, uh, companies, they always complain that the contracts are never being followed. Uh, this is a problem not only in Mozambique, this is a problem all over different countries where you have problems of uh, both uh, uh, contract enforcement and it very high illiterate levels. Some people have been uh, suggesting, for instance, that for uh, quality assurance, which is an important thing in, 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 in contract farming schemes, they need to have, for instance, uh, pictures or some type of visual uh, uh, characterization that can make possible for, for the farmer to understand what he's signing and what something more or less with full of pages, but more, more visual. 
another crucial thing is to have mediators in this process, either uh, NGOs, uh, government officials, and uh, and uh, um, and um, uh, uh, local farmers' organizations. They need to be they need to be in place in order to assure that 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 they understand the contract that they are and then don't feel cheated. Even in the case of more long-term schemes that are taking place, like in cotton production, for instance, that happens in Mozambique in contract farming for over 20 years now, and you have very strong farmers' organizations, they always feel that they're being cheated still because of price manipulation in, 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 in contracts and, and so forth. And also the, the huge imbalance in terms of access to information that they have, for instance, these farmers' organizations, they, in, in the case of cotton, they are very very well organized. They are quite uh, the leaders are very literate, but for instance, they don't have internet access in their in their base, so they cannot follow the prices. Well, so when it comes to negotiate price, they never know what's how, how if what the firm is saying is true or not. So you really have a huge need for mediators in these in these in these situations. Um, then. Uh, fourth, about the, about Malawi, uh, no, there is no, in terms of uh, Prosavana itself, there is n nothing relating to Malawi. Also, all the, actually, the, uh, all the zoning that has been done doesn't come as so close to, 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 to Malawi border. And, um, from the pro program itself so far, there is no, no, no thinking of collaborating in that in that sense. Although uh, uh, the negotiation between Valley and and the Malawian government went went uh, pretty smoothly, and they were able to make that, but so far there is no no collaboration going on. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, thanks for the two questions. Um, the shadow prices. Um, well, if you have the, the optimization model, you, I showed briefly that there is seven different activities and the, and the number of inputs are allocated to these, efficient, to these activities according to the highest payoff. And then at some point, one of the, some of these inputs are limited, so they become constraining the, the activity levels. And then the, the model tells you if you would have one additional unit that would be the value of it. That would be the value generated, and that's where I d how I derived those. Um, case selection in in Ethiopia and and why why at all Ethiopia? I mean, yes, you could argue if you if you want to understand free market economic impacts of these investments, then Ethiopia probably is not the ideal case. Mm, but Ethiopia was one of the countries, and still is, who was giving out a lot of land to foreign and domestic investors. Um, and when I was starting to, to select cases in 2010, I was, I was going to Addis and was trying to find data on what is actually, like I was trying to validate the media data which was around and looking at cases where actually things were happening because I thought it's, it's interesting to see what happens when such an investment starts. And then I was also relying on an investor who would allow me to do the research on the ground. And um, so I had narrowed down to a number of cases which were there, and then this Cambella area is an area where a lot of investments happened recently, so that's why I selected this case. Um, speculation of land, I'm, I'm actually not so sure to what extent um, the investors can speculate, because they get a lease over the land, which is normally 50 years, but they're not supposed to sub-lease it or su pass it on. And yeah, the payments are very low, but um, I haven't seen anything of that, and they can't, I mean, it's not that they're buying land, they're leasing on an annual rent, and the, the rental scheme has been sub revised already two years after the initial phase, so the government has adjusted it, ha has put it a bit higher, it's still very low, about, depending where you are, 10 to $15 per year per hectare, so it's not very expensive, but, um, no, in the center it's a bit more expensive, but in the periphery, so that is as a reaction. Thanks a lot. Okay, these are key important issues. Investment and investment in infrastructure and agriculture are really important for Africa, and we're uh, certainly going to hear 
a lot more about it in the future. And we had three good presentations here on these issues, which we'll take home and think more about. So thanks a lot, and let's give a big round of applause for the audience.